my jewelry. My studio is in Sharpsburg, um, which is uh, very near to my house in Highland Park. So it's just across the Highland Park Bridge. Um, and I share that studio with a couple other people. But yeah. Have you been getting into your studio and been able to be doing a lot of work during this time? Yeah, I kept my childcare, which was pretty much the saver of my business. So I, yeah, I, I could keep going to my studio. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And then Katie. Hi. Um, if you don't know me, which most, most people here do. Um, my name is Katie Johnson. I am the business support and impact specialist at the Creative Business Accelerator, which is a program of um, Bridgeway Capital, which is a local CDFI. If um, you're unfamiliar with Bridgeway or the CBA, um, it's uh, too much to unpack here for this panel, but I would love to talk to you. So you're welcome to reach out to me. Uh, my, my email address is sort of all over this partnership with, <laughs> with Trisha in the Handmade Arcade. And you can also check out our website, bridgewaycapital.org. Um, my work at the CBA, I wear a lot of different hats, but um, one of the big hats I wear is um, uh, providing technical assistance uh, for uh, creative businesses. I have um, a long history of also um, being an entrepreneur and a maker. My background is in ceramics. I've had two businesses, one making tableware um, when I lived in Asheville, North Carolina, and then I also um, was the director of Braddock Tiles. Um, so I also worked in Braddock <laughs> and I worked at the Braddock Carnegie Library too, which is a fantastic place. My little plug for the library. It's, um, it's just like the most magical community center, just like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can't say enough nice things about it. So if you ever want to check out a great public library, check out that library. Um, and a great introduction place for ceramics. Yeah, and I was the manager of the ceramic studio, which is um, a converted bathhouse. It's it's contested if it's the first library that Andrew Carnegie ever built in um, the United States. Some people um, say that it was uh, the in Homestead, but regardless, it's one of the earliest ones, and it was built with a bathhouse in the basement for steel workers to clean up before they went upstairs for. Um, programming really for for books and for uh, there's a theater in that um, bathhouse was converted into a ceramic studio because it's great tile there's drains on the floor but there is a, a gas reduction kiln in that um, in that studio which is in the basement of a building full of books it's really it's really amazing if any of the ceramicists out there can um, fathom that so anyways um, yeah so uh, I provide support for businesses using all of that experience. Um, and I also connect people to resources too. So if you're interested in um, learning more, getting some business support, uh, please feel free to reach out. I've had the pleasure of working with Trisha um, for a couple of years now, but really this year, uh, we partnered um, pretty deeply to create a maker curriculum, which is why you're here. Why, you know, this, this panel has been put together. And um, if you're viewing, then um, why do we registered? And so, you probably already know this, but um, please check out either of our websites, the Handmade Arcade's website or the CBA's site to see all of the great panel discussions and webinars and digital resources and on and on and on, all kinds of things to support businesses. Awesome, thank you. Alyssa, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself again really quickly because I realized I wasn't recording. We're not. Oh, when you're not sure. Just also, I'm glad that you came back to me because I have a critical introduction <laughs> note that I just realized, which is that Jenna, who is one of my, maybe my top confidant in the Pittsburgh maker community, who I text and call and annoy a lot, I met because she was my handmade arcade neighbor. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And I forgot. And then every year after that, we just requested to be neighbors. <laughs> And I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I hadn't thought of. But anyway, I am Alyssa Catalano and I am a co-founder of Studebaker Metals. We are a traditional metalsmithing workshop slash e-commerce brand slash wholesaler slash private label production facility um, slash dog kennel, whatever. <laughs> um, we're in Braddock. Um, 
the Braddock Carnegie Library is magic. It is the planet fitness of art. It is a judgment free <laughs> zone in the purest sense of the world. Um, word and world actually. Um, and yeah, I, now all I want to do is talk about the library. But anyway, so that's what we do. Uh, we make mostly, uh, we make unisex accessories uh, using traditional metal smithing techniques, but we make a lot of cuff bracelets and other personal accessories. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I do know, I do recall now you guys requesting to be next to one another. Um, so I just want to remind everyone who's participating tonight, if you have any questions, ask them in the question and answer panel and we will get, we will do our best to get to them. If you think of a question, just ask it. And if we may answer, we may have already answered it in what we discuss, but as we're going, just throw them up there. We're happy to, to help you in any way we can. So I'm going to start off. I have three slides to share to sort of talk about customer service and customer and just how to deal uh, you know, with some folks that just based on, I, I've never been, I've never had an online business, um, but I have dealt with lots and thousands and thousands of people in a day and many, many, many artists and makers. So I feel uh, pretty confident in some of the advice that I have to give. So, but as I speak, uh, uh, my three little uh, uh, slides I'm going to talk about, I'm going to ask for feedback and then we've got some specific questions I want to talk to the makers about. So here we go. Of course, I don't have it open. You're clearly in like a craft shed, which I am. <laughs> I'm in my hoard. I am in my hoard right now. <laughs> so, you know, it is, it, it's, uh, I try to do these webinars in like a less, um, oh, I'm not sharing my screen. I keep doing this with this. Okay. Here we go. All right. I tried to do it in a different room in my house, but every time I did, I had very, very technical difficulties. So, all right, you can all see my first slide. Mm -hmm. So the very first thing I wanted to talk about were your customer service expectations. And um, I think it's really important just for, uh, from a, uh, like the standpoint of someone who gets a lot of feedback every year from the makers, from the makers and from shoppers, um, to have a plan for customer service, like whether or not you participate or you you want to put that out there on your website or not, like what your uh, what your policies are. I think it's a good idea to think about some things before you embark on any kind of, especially now, like we're all sort of in this like new. Um, virtual world where people are going to be ordering and we're used to in person where we can have sort of like a you know like a face-to-face -face conversation explain things to people um so some of the things that i wanted to sort of talk about with everyone tonight was um are what kind of customer service messaging do you have on your website and do you have a plan of action um have you thought through like what to do if somebody gets something from you that's defective or when you mail it, it's fine, but by the time it gets there, it's broken, uh, wrong orders, missing orders, and a return policy. So like, for example, um, I think it's important that you sort of have an internal thought process on some of these things. And I think it's important for makers to um, think through that in, in the event that it happens. Um, we're all living in sort of like a heightened emotional time and people, um, you know, people can misdirect themselves and misdirect their emotions. So if the more you think about something ahead of time, I feel like the better off you're going to be able to manage it when it happens. Um, so just like sort of think about like, have you ever placed an, on order, an online order and when you, you know, if something happened, like recently, my daughters have been, I have two teenage daughters and they've been ordering all kinds of clothes online and we got a completely wrong order and getting the message and the everything like sorted out was frustrating, but we did it. Um, so I wanted to ask like Alyssa and Jenna specifically, like, what do you, what do you, what do you do in your businesses? Um, I know like Jenna, you may mail things out as a ceramicist and you, know, you think you, 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 you know, something breaks or, you know, I, I, what, what sort of like advice or um, like ways would you like, what would you advise makers on sort of thinking through a plan of action essentially to like make sure if something goes wrong, 
the maker is on top of it and has a good plan to follow through and make sure the customer comes back. Yeah, um, customer service and taking really good care of my customers is very important to me. Um, I, I do sort of bend over backwards to make my customers happy. Um, there are certain things that I have limits on, but in terms of logistical errors on my part or their part, I'll come up with a solution to fix it. Um, specifically breakage, which is a big issue for ceramics. I take a lot of pride and um, I'm really thoughtful about my packaging and shipping. Um, I'm really careful with what products I use. I'm really careful about doing it properly. There's really um, a right way to package ceramics and there's a careless way to package ceramics. And, um, but if anything does break, I take responsibility for it, even, even if it's not my fault, even if it is the shipper's fault. Um, I still, I still will replace the item. Um, even, even if, um, it was clearly like smashed in, like in, in the process of getting there. Um, yeah, I, I, if, if something was a like mix up on their end or my end, I'll sometimes try to come up with a creative solution to fix it. But, um, in terms of a, yeah, like any sort of breakage, I just replace it. I don't, I don't feel like it's worth the stress on my customer's end um, or the potential to have for them to have a bad experience. So I just, um, I sort of just go above and beyond and to make it right. I think that's great advice. That's what I would do, but I don't want to, you know, I don't, I'm not, you know, like, do you find that when um, you, so do you ever have people mail things back to you or because it's ceramics, you sort of just are like, okay, it was broken. I'll send you a replacement. I, I wouldn't have anybody mail something that's broken back to me. I would have them just throw it away. Okay. Um, even if I like mixed up an order, I, I've done that before, like fluke, fluke, flukishly sent the wrong thing to the wrong person. I just have them keep it. I don't have them try to send it back to me. Um, yeah, I wouldn't make it, I, I try not to make it, anybody do any extra work. Um, sometimes even if there's like an exchange or something, sometimes I'll just say, you know what, just keep it because I, I don't want them to do extra work and I'd rather them be super happy. What about you, Alyssa? Do you, does Studebaker Metals have any advice on any of these kind of ideas or plans of actions? Yeah, so, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's actually funny to have um, ceramics and metal um, <laughs> side by side on a lot of these points. Um, but, you know, also, you know, uh, Jen and I also differ in what is sort of like our most forward facing part of our business, at least historically as well. And so I, um, as an e-commerce first business, have had to um, obviously address these as, as policies on my site, but also completely rethink these as value adds. Um, and so I would actually argue that if you're going for like a big share of your sales on e-commerce that all of these and, and probably more like a clear shipping policy is one thing I, I see there um, would be critical to the sort of like trust map of your customer. And what I, what I sort of mean by that is like, these are things that people look for to legitimize their purchase, um, even just their existence, unfortunately, not even necessarily their content. Um, but I also sort of take each of these and some of these are sort of grouped together for me, um, and look for a sort of, uh, sales pitch within them. So, you know, for us, we're, we're fortunate with what we make and our process of forging is that like our pieces, like, you know, our slogan is handmade to last a lifetime. Um, our shit's kind of unbreakable. Um, that doesn't mean people don't break them. They do, but it's just very rare. Um, and so to have the messaging that everything that we sell has a lifetime guarantee, uh, including for breakage, we pretty much cover everything except um, loss sort of after the fact. We do um, take responsibility essentially for 
the loss of a package in transit, which I'll talk to in a minute, but um, really going through these things and thinking about how uniquely to your business they become a part of the sale. Um, and step one to that is just their existence. Um, and I would suggest if you're sort of like, oh, where do I start? Um, look at look at brands like yours with a larger online presence, see what they have and use that as a template. I mean, that's the, the low hanging, hanging fruit way to do it. Um, but, you know, for instance, with, with shipping, we have a clear shipping policy um, that once something leaves here, it's not our responsibility, but I specifically have that there because if someone's package is lost and then they reach out to me, um, I ship them a new one and I file a claim on my end and luckily I have a good shipping relationship. Your, your shipping relationship is maybe the most important relationship in your business. I want to shout that out. Um, Jordan, I, I agree with that. We, we actually had a, a whole, we had a whole seminar a few weeks ago all about shipping. So I want to yeah. just tell anyone who's here tonight who might not have been for that one to go back and listen to that because that is so true, Alyssa. It is shipping, be, having a good shipping plan and policy and relationship is key. I would yeah. also add, just thinking about the past content, we also had um, a webinar, it was the Meet the Experts um, with Trellis Legal talking about your the policies and um, strategies to create also your terms on your website as well. But sort of how to lay these things out, um, both to protect you legally, but also just, I think that trust aspect that Alyssa um, spoke to is really important. People are more, you're, you will have higher conversion if people clearly understand um, your policies and feel like they'll be taken care of. Um, but it is tied with the legal, so I would recommend watching that as well. Yeah, and depending on your platform that you're selling on, uh, there's a lot of like legal templating included in that. And I know that I think that Marlene from Trellis also uh, either free shares or at low cost provides that stuff. But I think that the other thing is like, if you are a small business, like you have more places to communicate that than just your about page and like use that as an opportunity to put your personality into these things that are usually like kind of like meh. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about using your personality as a small business uh, to put into things like not just on your about us page, do you, do you put it like when you like in an email when like the, the order is placed and they get that automatically generated email or where else do you sort of like put that messaging in um, within your business? Specifically around these topics or just like injecting the personality piece? Um, I think specifically around the like sort of like customer service. Of yeah, goes I think I think it's your it's like sort of a tone you carry through all of it. So like obviously there's your landing pages for these that are going to be like held in your footer primarily for the things that are on this list. Um, and even just the way that you like introduce that footer or like the way you have it laid out, you can you can give like visual personality as well, but also like once they click in, um, I think, and, and I'm not even saying that I'm like the master at this because these are more like higher level concepts that I'm not even that great at. But, you know, like if someone is reaching out through uh, like a site submission or something, or even on Instagram, you know, our, our sort of thing is inclusivity. We are super size inclusive and um, price point inclusive. Um, and so we treat people like, they are, you know, like part of a, a, a family um, once they're a customer, regardless of sort of the way that we're scaling. Um, and I think that that sort of messaging, if someone has a missing package, I'm like, oh, and they're like, should I reach out to this? Should I do this? And then you can usually feel their tone. And so you just keep it super short and you're like, you know, hey, Brad, it's always Brad. Um, no offense to any Brads. That was arbitrary um it's like you know hey brad don't even worry about this don't waste your time i'll take care of it i'll have a new one go out the door in the next couple of days and i'll handle fedex shipping's crazy you know like whatever um so you know just kind of choosing your tone and some people have you know like even even jenna and i feel like jenna maybe you insert here i feel like you have a really sophisticated customer and a really sophisticated like beautiful branding and so you know like you you might have a more polished and professional tone and that's also a reflection of our personalities i think that's all i think it's all really great i'm nice i'm not i'm not fancy 
I think that's all great insights, which is I switched to my next slide, which sort of covers a lot of this, which is, you know, treat customers like you want to be treated. Be kind and patient, listen to them. Empathy is key and use effective listening. And what I, you know, what I mean, I'm gonna just like sort of talk to you about what I mean about those four and then hand it over. Um, you know, I've, I've been a web developer and graphic designer and maker for over 20 years. And um, I know it's hard to believe I look so young, but it's true. And uh, I've, I have learned over my 20 years of, as a, specifically as a designer, um, it's really important to sort of like maintain that sort of like self-control in the sense that like somebody might call you and be complaining or messaging you or being complaining about um, their, their product and it might, and, 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 I'm, and I'm not like specifically talking to anyone, but um, you know, they, I find that you, you know, you, the kinder you are and the, the, the easier it is to diffuse. Um, and if you can like, you know, listen to them and hear them and not get defensive about, you know, like it's hard as an artist, I think, and as a maker and as someone who is putting their heart and soul into their products. And, you know, we, this is a labor of love for many of us. Um, and I mean, even my work as like the Hammond Arcade Executive Director, this is a labor of love for me. And I find that like when someone comes to the welcome table and wants to complain to me about how they really want to shop, but now they're all stressed out because parking was a nightmare on the day of the event, um, the kinder and the more I can be like, oh, I know, I know, I know, it's so, it's awful. We have, we always have this cheerleading competition here. I have, you know, I'm so sorry and like give them a sticker or a pin or whatever. And that tends to help. Um, and I find that with, when you're, you know, when you're listening to someone who might have, you know, they might be having a bad day and they might be taking it out on you. Being empathetic is key and effectively listening, like just sort of like, you know, be, whoops, I didn't mean to change that. Ah, now I'm going crazy. Um, just like be present, you know, when you're listening. Um, I know we're all doing a thousand things and, the, and like, you know, we're on, we're watching uh, <laughs> the news or we're, you know, on our social media or we're trying to be, a, you know, make our, our products. There's so many levels to being a small business owner that when a customer wants your attention, you want to be present and you sort of want to um, just sort of listen, like mindfully listen. And I find like it, you, the, I'm just going to give like a little antidote. I was a poll worker on Tuesday. I was the judge of elections in my local polling place. And a lot of people came in ready to fight with me about their absentee ballot or their mail-in ballot or wanting to do a provisional ballot or ready to ready to like get into an argument with me and every single person that walked into the polling place i greeted with a oh what how are you thank you for coming in and voting what's your name and I, the kinder i was the faster the stressful i was waiting in line a long time uh you know i'm worried that my votes aren't going to count kind of thing was diffused and so i feel that's like you know i felt like i felt like that was like i felt like it was like a 15 hour lesson in customer service on tuesday <laughs> and uh so um, when you talk about like, you know, you were sort of like touching on that, Alyssa, like treat your customers how you want to be treated. And, and, and Jenna, you were as well, like sort of like, you know, get things back to them. And, um, you know, this is sort of like, I'm just, a, this slide is just a re repetition of what was just said, but do you, is there like kind of anything else that you're feeling like that you would want to share about, you know, and then I want to get into like a little further into like the actual customer retention stuff um, in a minute, but you know, like, is there any like, other advice you would want to give makers off of this slide or? <laughs> I have one sort of note to this, which is um, treat your customers very well, but as your presence expands, you have to learn to recognize who is your customer and who is just someone making noise. Um, Great. Bit of advice. And um, just you don't have to be nice to, to everybody, especially people on uh, like Facebook and Instagram, and you can just delete something that's just shitty. Um, and that is probably the best thing that you can do with something like that. Um, and then, uh, or, or, you know, use it as an opportunity. But the, the other thing I would just say to that is like, uh, be kind and you can usually disarm people, but like you don't, 
have to do the customer's always right thing. You just have to kind of do the customer's always probably going to leave a review thing. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, one side note to that, um, that I've also observed <clears throat> over the years. Um, and this is actually, uh, someone that I used to share a studio with and I watched her business get really big and, um, that created more customers and, um, with more customers came more problems. And she, uh, the way that she handled that was that she had a personal account. This was like when Facebook was still a thing, it was really before Instagram. And she would vent about her customers on her personal Facebook. And then she had her client facing Facebook. It never, I never saw it really come back around to her, at least when, well, I, and I've lost touch with her completely, but like, it was, um, it wasn't like a great look, you know? And so, and I've actually seen other makers do this. And so my little bit of advice is, um, it may seem obvious, but there are personality types and I get it because like all that labor we're talking about, like it's hard to be the recipient of people's anger and it's hard to put a, a, a smile on your face and say, what can I do for you? Find an outlet for that whatever it is for you, whether that's like pounding the pillow or, you know, like calling your mom or walking your dog or calling your best friend or <clears throat> writing in your journal, whatever it is, don't let it be public. Don't say it publicly. Don't put it out there. It never goes away and they will probably see it at some point or at least other potential clients will see it. Um, it's not a good look. Yeah. Don't forget the people screenshot things and share them. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when you talk about like sort of solving the problem, I totally agree with you, Alyssa, that the customer is not always right. They're not. Um, I am a people pleaser. I'm the middle child of an Italian family. So that's, that plays as a, like, that's like a, my strongest, that's like my biggest strength and my, and my biggest weakness all wrapped up into one because I am sort of like a peacemaker and a people pleaser. Um, but I do think that like in my, from my perspective of some things that I've seen and complaints that I've got as just sort, sort of a event planner, um, I think it's really important for makers, especially, uh, you know, like newer or less evolved makers to sort of stay on top of that social media. Like you said, Alyssa, like delete a negative comment. You have control over that. Don't necessarily engage. Um, if you, if that, if you're not going to get, you can tell, right? Like you can sort of tell if someone's just going to, is there to, you know, complain or if they're there to like actually get a problem solved. So that I think is important. And um, one of the things that I think is super important to mention, just from my perspective, is check your messages and stay on top of your email because what can happen, happened this summer uh, to, it what was kind of interesting, um, a maker that has been a participant of Handmade Arcade for many years, um, who uh, I love and I actually always buy from, I, I don't know. I mean, it was a hard, it was a difficult summer, right? Like everyone had an incredibly difficult summer and I, I kind of had like a, some, a super inappropriately grouchy email from someone telling me that, that we, I should never, ever, ever allow this maker back into our event because of a variety of reasons, because they had had a negative interaction and to which I wrote back, well, you know, it's been a difficult time for makers and yet, you know, and just my whole thing. And I was like, thanks for letting me know, but you know, uh, thanks, <laughs> but thanks. And I let, and I let that go. And I obviously didn't let the maker, the particular maker uh, know because it was, it was crazy, but never underestimate the power of an angry customer to try to kind of like spoil things for you in that sense, because this person was clearly trying to get me to say, oh, you're right. I will never let them back into Handmade Arcade again. And which is not something I would do. And, um, I think that like, if you are able to, uh, one of the things like when I was doing the research for this um, event, for this webinar was to, I, did, I read a lot of, I read a lot of articles about, uh, you know, dealing with customers. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that kept coming up over and over again was is this, like if you can like listen and turn their problem into a positive experience, like Jenna was saying, like, you know, replacing their broken ceramics, or if you can do it in a single interaction, the percentage of, the, of them like being like coming out of that situation and being this is oh that was great they were so kind and great and they solved the problem right away 
uh, what is to your benefit. So there, there are, um, you know, I think benefits to, to that. And I think staying on top of like social media uh, messaging and posts um, is, is important. And I also think it's important to uh, not just stay on top of social media because somebody might post something negative, but if people post positive things, you want to like them or heart them or thank them in some way. So they, they want to come back and shop again. They feel seen. Um, so before I like sort of exit out of my little three slide thing, uh, do you guys have any sort of advice or comments around any, any of like sort of solving the problem situations or I mean, after that? Um, I might just chime in and say that this spring, summer, there was a lot of, I ship um, with the post, postal service. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a lot of shipping problems, a lot of tracking numbers not coming through, a lot of lost packages. There was a bunch of snafus for me. Um, and I got a bunch of um, messages from concerned customers, even some of them before they had purchased because of experiences they'd had recently buying from other businesses. Um, and um, so I had to do a lot of um, just shipping out new things, replacing things. I, I like ate it on a lot of, on a lot of stuff. Um, but I think it's important to think of the loyalty and retention of your customers as a real investment because just strategically, even beyond like um, being a good person, I think it's just really like there's a real opportunity for the for your loyal customers to be a huge um, source of revenue for you. They'll just keep coming back and and supporting you. And so I think rather than getting stressed out and bent out of shape about that kind of stuff, I think you should just think of it as um, an opportunity to to grow to grow your customer base and to and to build the loyalty of your customers. Um, so, so not being super defensive and not being super stressed about some of that stuff and just think of it as an opportunity more. Yeah, I think that that's great because that kind of leads right into my next question, which is, um, it's twofold. So what is your, do you have a strategy around a new customer acquisition? And then um, after that, what do you do? What is your strategy around like customer retention? So, um, Alyssa, do you have any advice for uh, how do you find new customers? Where do you go? And then once you have someone purchase from you, what do you do to keep them coming back? Yeah, so um, we have sort of two markets. When we're talking about direct to customer for us, we have a international market and then a domestic market. Internationally, our customer acquisition is almost 100% through either in-person events, not necessarily selling events, but um, like marketing events or, um, or mostly presence of our product in uh, wholesale accounts in those places. Um, so there's some sort of edge we have with the international market that are introduced to our brand through um, through resellers, um, but then come to our website and are able to see like our larger collection or they become collectors that way. Um, domestically, which is more relevant, um, we do very few in-person events. Actually, Handmade Arcade is one of maybe two in-person events we do each year. Um, and we rely really heavily on um, the word of mouth, obviously, of our customers, but primarily on targeted ads. Um, we do pretty um, significant spend in that realm. Um, and that's obviously the beginning of our funnel and certainly not the end of our acquisition uh, funnel. So we start with ads and then, you know, um, we want to get the click and the engagement there. And then from the click, we want them to land in a space that feels trustworthy and credible. And that's where we talk about things like, footer links and product descriptions and trust badges and 
uh, you know, verified payment processors and, you know, the super sexy stuff. Um, and then from there, when someone's about to um, add something to cart, we want them to look at product reviews. We want um, to have them get through our checkout process without bugs. We want them to um, be incentivized by maybe like a promo code through an ad or a welcome email. We want them to sign up for the newsletter. Like we want them to get the sort of whole experience that makes them an actual customer. Um, but from the, the very top level, I would say that like probably 80% of our new acquisition is coming from ads. And unfortunately, because I don't really want Mark Zuckerberg to have any of my money, um, for e-commerce specifically, that is um, a pretty like limited path uh, from my experience right now. Um, yeah. Do you, use, do, do you do Google ads? Do you use like Google AdWords? Have you invested? We don't. In we, we focus on, when it comes to the Google side, we focus on SEO management. Um, it's just more successful for us. We have done Google ads. Um, not to say we wouldn't do them in the future, but the, for the type of brand we are, which is very lifestyled and the sort of demo that we approach, we found that our um, ROI was a lot stronger on social. And so we also are a very small team. There's eight of us total here and one and a half of us working on this kind of stuff. So um, spoiler alert, it's me. Um, and so we um, have to sort of focus that because that is, and I, I do have a, a contractor that does my actual um, like targeting strategies and stuff, um, everything. As, except content. Um, so um, I work really closely with that individual and that's, that's where it all begins. But it's certainly not how you acquire a customer. That's how you acquire a set of eyeballs. Um, when you talk about your international market, how did you sort of go, make that leap from national to international? Did it happen purposefully or organically? Um, so it was like seven and a half years ago when we broke into like the Asian market. Um, it started in Japan and now we have distribution there, Hong Kong and Korea. Well, wow. Korea. Um, and uh, Taiwan, sorry. Um, so that started uh, back then, like everything was sort of organic. Um, so it was uh, purposeful in a way in uh, using certain tools back then. It was a lot of the sort of like beginning of influencer marketing, which was blogs. Um, so it was really, really easy to get free write-ups and stuff like that and to end up in Reddit threads and stuff like that. And that's how we met our first partners in Japan. And then um, now our primary distribution is France and Europe and um, Japan and Taiwan in Asia. Um, so uh, that's like its whole own long story. If anyone is looking for some sort of international partner conversation, I will leave my email in the chat and you can send me a message. Awesome. Thank you. Um, what about you, Jenna? Do you have any, uh, like strategy on, you know, acquiring new customers and then what do you do to like sort of retain them? Because I feel like, especially with both of your brands, it is a, like a life, they are the sort of lifestyle brands and you want to collect pieces and you want to, you know, grow your like I mean I know that like with ceramics like I know specifically like we get asked every year from him in arcade is you know this ceramicist or this ceramicist is going to be there because I want to buy a new piece for my collection so um what do you do sort of around that around those topics yeah um new customer acquisition stuff strategy I um I mean I do a lot on Instagram but I would say like I'm a lot more scrappy I don't really have much of an ad budget so I um and I just do it all myself so um be I would say like for Instagram so Instagram um and then I will also say like in-person shows has always been like not just um a revenue driver for me but more of like a marketing opportunity that's why I really haven't dropped them um because it's really a great way for people to touch 
um, and experience my products in person in a more like personal and tactile way, as well as just, I get FaceTime with them. I get my products in front of people that, um, that I wouldn't necessarily. Um, so I haven't dropped in person shows. I don't do many. I just don't really have time and they're a ton of work, but, um, I would say I probably do four or five a year. And I really think of them as an opportunity to acquire um, new customers. Um, and, uh, and it's a really often a really like impactful and meaningful way to acquire new customers. Um, and then uh, I would say also my like acquisition of new customers is really tied to my retention of, of customers and like building on loyalty um, really creates like good word of mouth and like a, a strong relationship between my customers and my brand and me. And, um, and that's sort of really invaluable too, especially if like, especially since I'm operating on such a little marketing budget, um, just really investing in my, uh, loyal customers can turn into, uh, new customers just because of like strong, happy word of mouth. Um, so that's really connected to, I would say, um, and then I also, I do some sort of like, uh, fun collaborative type of things, a little bit more just like creative ways to try to acquire new customers. Um, I do some custom work for cafes and coffee shops, that kind of stuff. And that gets my work in front of, um, audiences that I uh, that I wouldn't necessarily interact with um so that's sort of another like creative way I try to acquire new customers when you do work for cafes and coffee shops how do you make sure that the folks who are like eating there or having their coffee know like do you put it in your contract do you work out those details ahead of time that it is clear that this is uh you know a handmade ceramics piece by a local artist like how do you have that in your contract I don't usually have it in my contract but it's something that's sort of mutually beneficial if a coffee shop or a cafe is going to invest uh, a lot more money in buying handmade uh, local ceramics it sort of behooves them to uh, let people know where they came from I get a lot of inquiries from those collaborations um and uh, I, I also like, I stamp the bottoms. So if they look at them, hopefully when they're not full, they'll actually see my <laughs> logo. But, and they have like postcards and stuff, but I've found that if I'm, usually if I'm gonna do a collaboration like that, um, I wanna make sure that the, that the business is also just a strong collaborative partner. So I won't say yes to anything that I don't really feel like is gonna be a slam dunk collaboration marketing opportunity yeah i think that's it's true she recently told me no i told Stuart baker no <laughs> uh isn't that it's, I'm, I'm sorry that she said no to you Alyssa, but jenna isn't that really empowering i recently said no to someone and i, felt, I was like oh, that felt so good <laughs> i have had so many children i could say yes to so many more things yeah. i understand no but what i was going to say to that i was just kidding about that. i mean she just did it <laughs> I was I wasn't anyway. Um, I was gonna say that um, one thing that is sort of like playing the game, but like this is it, 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 Jenna's situation with like coffee shops and being in the museum, which that stuff is beautiful, that blue stuff. Um, is that people don't want to be told to like you they want to discover you themselves and that's a really big part of being a maker and that doesn't mean like sit back and let everyone find you it means make a strategy so that people think and feel and connect with a situation where they are finding you and discovering you so it almost is better um to you know it, that experience of like walking in and being like you know what i really like this I, this, this shop is beautiful. This is the aesthetic that I aspire to. I love this mug. Like, let me look at it. Ooh, I can look it up. Now I know this brand that other people don't know. And that's, and I'm going to give this as a gift and sort of creating that, um, ooh, I just sort of like happened upon you more organic thing, uh, can be very strong, if not manual, but in the beginning, that's, that's really your power. Um, and I was going to mention on top of that from, uh, 
years ago now, and forgive me, um, Trisha, if this was not, not legal, I don't know, I ask for forgiveness. Um, but at Handmade Arcade, we were, we were a much more wholesale focused business, but we were trying to like kind of get direct rolling in a more meaningful way at the time. And we weren't doing um, paid advertising. And so we um, set up a program at Handmade Arcade, which was like the first weekend in December. And if you made a purchase, we just sort of like tucked a little card and told you that it was a 15% off code for our website, good until December 24th or whatever. Um, and so it was a really short lived thing. It was a specific code that we could track them all. Um, and the response to that, like the sales response to that was like really impactful for us. And so it was like someone was there, they made an impulse buy, they liked it. They were like, oh, I'm gonna get this for a Christmas gift. Also, I have this expiring discount code. It was like, it was like getting, it was like the workaround to Mark Zuckerberg. It was like really a special sort of like moment there. Um, and so, especially for someone who's like maybe doing a holiday show or something, um, we weren't just like kind of handing them out to everyone. We were handing them out as a um, retargeting sort of gimmick, like an in-person retargeting thing for people that we knew were proven buyers. No, that's, A, that's not illegal at all. We thoroughly encourage people to offer a, like if you want to offer like a handmade arcade discount post event because you found out about it at our event to encourage customers to come to your website and shop more. We thoroughly encourage that. Um, so, so uh, and I think that that's interesting because I've, I've had feedback from makers of, um, uh, that say that they've never gotten any sales from those um, sort of like discount codes or postcards that put in bags to you saying that you had a great experience. And I wonder if what the difference is, is that you said that you sort of sort of targeted like you didn't give it to everyone, which might have been the key. Like you sort of thought like, well, this seems like a, a customer who might come back and buy or based on what they purchased. So I think that that's a smart strategy, which leads me into my next question, um, which is uh, I'm going to ask this next question because we're getting close to seven. I know we started a little later. Um, and then I have a question um, in the Q&A, which sort of like is like a follow up to my next question. But um, so when you when you talk about like sort of mapping out a customer journey and people finding you either like, you know, organically or thinking that they found you organically. Um, I feel like people are constantly, you know, multi-channeling, right? With like social media and device, multiple devices. They're working on their laptop, they're on their, you know, iPads, they're on their phones, they're on their computers. Um, do you have a way that do you, um, do you engage best with customers? Do you do it with, uh, do you like what works best for your specific business? I know that both of you, I, I mean, just from my perspective as somebody who's constantly looking at people's photographs and the way that they present themselves, I think that the both of you put out such incredibly beautiful pictures and thoughtful put together pictures of your, of your work that it's, you clearly think about it and you clearly have a strategy around it. So do you like, how do you engage what works best for you? And, uh, do you do it like with posts or emails? Um, do you have a, I mean, I'm, I know you have a plan. I know you have a plan around it, but are there like spontaneous posts or different things that you do that you find like work better, like, like everyone now and again will work really well. What, what would you sort of like, what advice would you give to like a maker to map out that customer journey? Go ahead, Jenna. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I use it. <laughs> I do use Instagram a lot. I um, I think one no, I would one thing I would say about Instagram specifically, and I guess social media overall is just. Um, and I've been given this feedback specifically is that people don't want to be sold to all the time. So to remember to keep social media also social. Um, so a lot of my following are also clay people, not just customers. Um, and so I do try to have a mix of um, things that are for sale, but also sort of day-to-day -day updates, a lot of process and tips and tricks kind of stuff. Um, I really try to have sort of a mix of um, professional photos and just like stuff I do myself in the studio. Um, and I think it keeps it just more authentic, which is just true to my brand in general, but 
Um, but also it gets kind of exhausting and unfun to be like sold to all the time. So I try to keep my social media a good mix of things, but remember to keep it social. Do you send, um, do you have like an email list to engage with them or how do you, so this, the question that's asked is, um, is there anything you'd like to share about client lists, loyalty programs for regular customers, basically just in general, how do you keep it organized? What do you use? Google Sheets, MailChimp, Square, and how often are you reaching out directly to your clients? And it's a long question, any special treats and um, what does that look like? Yeah, I don't have a specific like loyalty pro points program. Um, I, I do have, I do use MailChimp and I do use like some segmented targeted emails. I should do more of that and more planned stuff of that. If I'm going to spend some money on marketing, I probably am going to have somebody work on that for me. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if I have a ton. To, I feel like Alyssa probably has more, more planny stuff about that. Uh, so I, um, oh yeah. So there's a few answers here. And I think that it, for me, it has come down to like taking my business to the next level was very centered around, um, uh, embracing software. Um, and so, uh, I think that's like a hard step for a lot of people because there's so much software out there and it all costs money and it adds up and it feels, um, scary, but, um, for instance, like I, I use Clavio, um, and for that's, uh, for email. And, um, like I said before, like I have a, a bandwidth issue. And so my email is super focused on the individual experience and not really my like greater newsfeed dump. We do, uh, I'm sorry, my, my like email list dump and we do do stuff with that, but more so we make sure that like when a customer signs up for the list, they're being given an incentive. Um, when they um, abandon a cart, we're following up and we're having a conversation about that. Um, we are segmenting that stuff out based on the amount in their cart and having different communications going to them based on those things. Um, after somebody's purchased, we're sending an email a couple of days later we're sending an email to them that's um, tailoring the different like complimentary stuff based on what they purchased. Um, and then, uh, you know, a couple weeks after their purchase, we're reaching out for a review, um, depending on what it is they purchased and how badly we need the review, we'll incentivize the review with a further discount. Um, and so those are just examples. That stuff is is overwhelming because there's so much when you get into like customer specific segmenting, but it is a very low, relatively low cost way to get very, very powerful return. Um, email always seems like such a big deal to people um, and you can automate a ton of it um, and never really have to worry about creating some like gorgeous bulk email um, to get it rolling. So I suggest um, someone who really wants to flip their sales this season to, um, I personally switched from MailChimp because in that sector, it just wasn't as powerful as Clavio. Clavio is a little bit more expensive. So it just depends because if you're sending to like bigger lists or bigger segments, MailChimp is absolutely, absolutely works. Um, so um, if you want to get into things like the welcome series and, you know, more, sophisticated abandoned carts and stuff like that. I think that Clavio is, is pretty cool. There's also a lot of support there. I don't work for them. It seems like I do. Um, the other thing I'll say about loyalty, like we don't do a points program, um, but we have loyal customers who will reach out and like ask for a special discount. And we're always like, Oh yeah, of course for you. Um, but that's kind of our, our stock answer. And so we have some code set up for that. And then the other piece of that is um, instead of doing like a, affiliate marketing sort of like direct program that we have to manage. We do use an app. Um, we use go app pro, um, which is set up rather than like an affiliate marketing, it's set up as an ambassador program. And so what anyone can find, uh, go G O A F F pro. Um, it's, it's, um, I'm pretty sure 
it crosses platforms, but I use Shopify for reference. Um, that one's, it's really basic. I think that I'm on the free version still. Um, and essentially anyone can sign up to be an ambassador and they're incentivized to talk about our brand because they get a 10% kickback on any sale using their link. So um, it, it pays for itself. We give out a first time buyer discount code anyway. Um, and so, um, you know, just stuff like that. You have to, that's the stuff that works for us. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that works for our particular demographic and with that demographic rather. And so I think just stepping back and not being scared and just realizing you don't have to build out some like huge customer engagement program to like get an email that goes out and like tells them some stuff or even, you know, playing around with which emails or which programs or which apps will work for you. They all have trials. So, um, and they all have a lot of support and also freelancers who will do the work for you. So um, I can say with confidence that anything that I've mentioned, also uh, live chat, that's huge, but that's a suck on your life. But if, you, if, you're, if you're looking for every dollar, you should have live chat enabled on your site um, and someone actually answering it or very sophisticated bots. Point being, I can say that any uh, sort of software that I use, including my CRM, has all more than paid for itself and is, is well worth any investment. Are there any other products then that you, like either one of you would use? I mean, what do you both, do you use, um, just what, like what, what do you host your web, your e-commerce sites on? Are they both, are they on Shopify or are they, or do you have custom builds? I'm actually in the process of migrating from Etsy to Shopify, um, which is kind of an interesting place to be um, because I feel like I have a foot in both worlds, but I, Alyssa can speak more to Shopify stuff. All I ever want to talk about is Shopify <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so how's Shopify going? And she's like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I, think um, that, I think that based on like what I have been learning, you know, over the the past, you know, the many years that I've been working with makers, um, but not actually selling anything on my, aside from at, my, at Handmaid Arcade, is that migrating to your own website on something like Shopify is in the long run going to be a lot better for your business. So Alyssa, that being said, what, what, how do you feel about my statement? We migrated from Squarespace to Shopify after five years and it was, a. Uh, process and it was scary and it was uncomfortable in a lot of ways but it, the advice I would give to anyone just starting out if you're about to build a site or something is to just start with a Shopify it doesn't have to be Shopify um, there's a couple of other options um, but if you are looking to sell Squarespace wouldn't be my first choice there um, they were they were perfect and they were one of the people who started and that worked for us for a long time. But when it comes to more powerful tools, I, I, I mean, Shopify is a cult. So once you're in, you're in, so. No, I mean, I didn't mean necessarily mean <laughs> Shopify. I meant sort of like migrating away from, from Etsy. I feel like when you migrate oh, okay. away from Etsy, I feel like for makers, that's a big step. Like you, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, people that, I, you know, over the years, over the past, like, and I've been involved with Hammond Arcade since 2006. So over the past 14 years, I've seen, Etsy change, you know, like this huge, it's a, has changed. I, I, my husband actually even like, he's a programmer. He actually even interviewed with them and was very close to like working with them. But I think that when you, um, when you make that sort of like leap into like, like I'm really in this, I'm really in this maker world. And I really want to make, make this my, my, like, I, I want to like commit to it. I feel like that's sort of like a natural progression is to sort of move from Etsy to a more like, branded site i think is what i sort of meant by that um we um we skipped etsy yeah so um i didn't oh, you I, have i feel like you have a little more marketing savvy a little more maybe not savvy but i think that you came from i mean i worked in marketing for yeah. like 12 years for e-commerce before i started so i mean that definitely gives you a different lens but i, I don't think that's why well, that's probably why I didn't start on Etsy because that wasn't my comfort zone. But I think there is absolutely a place for Etsy, especially for makers, like a really big place. And I, I, that's not me. That's not me dissing Etsy whatsoever. And Etsy is also a very different tool than it was seven or eight years ago. Um, and I am 
I believe myself to be knowledgeable in a lot of things um, in my overconfidence, but I, Etsy is not one of those things. I don't know shit about Etsy. Um, um, but I, I, but I often will, if, you know, someone asks me my opinion about something, there are a lot of people that when I look at their product or what they have going on or what their bandwidth is, I, I wholeheartedly endorse Etsy as like a really good first step. I agree. I think it is a great first platform, but I think I do believe that there comes a point in every maker scalability where it's maybe time to. Well, if anyone asked me though, I would probably say make both at the same time. Oh, it's not a bad choice. That's not a yeah, bad choice. I will say I'm not killing my Etsy. I won't, I won't make it die. Yeah. I'll do both. Yeah. yeah, well, and yeah, because you've got a history. You've got a long history with Etsy. And yeah, people yeah I have a ton working. of reviews. I have a ton of um, people who just know me through there. So I can't disappear on there. I'll just probably... It is the time to diversify. Yeah. That's, it is the yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one more, there's one more question um, from the Q&A. And uh, we're going to wrap up in a few minutes. So if anybody else out there has questions, throw them up uh, now. Um, we want to know uh, where we were asked, Alyssa, can you elaborate a little more on why you love Squarespace for Shopify? Why I prefer Shopify to Squarespace? Yes. Um, so where we landed, um, wh what made us actually, there were kind of a lot of um, things um, that would add up, but our sort of breaking point was just the capabilities of the tool. And so like, you know, for instance, we, I, and I think, I don't know if Squarespace has fixed this in the last two years, but like just little, like obvious things, like if you clicked on a variant of one of our products, like the picture wouldn't change. And that to me, I, like honestly, that was like, I waited for a few months and was like, this is nuts. I can't take this, but I, I that, that seems really specific and it is, but that is just an example of like a larger thing, which is that like Squarespace is a really great portfolio platform in my opinion. Um, and it's really beautiful when it comes to its um, templates for that. So all of these um, sort of site builders and site hosts are all about templating. Um, that's what makes them you not hiring somebody to code your shit. And so um, when you are choosing which one is right for you, you need to think about the tools that you need and then look at what types of things are included um, either on free sort of themes or paid themes, either one. But um, for me, we just sort of outgrew Squarespace, Squarespace's capabilities. Um, and, uh, you know, Shopify is a completely different, different beast. Um, it, it's run on you know, apps that plug into it um, and expand your capability in all sorts of ways. But um, I would suggest if you are sort of in between the two, a really good way to see a lot of different uses and opinions to compare is to get into a couple of Facebook groups. I normally would never suggest anyone get in a Facebook group, um, but you can get into Shopify specific groups and Squarespace specific groups and just see the kinds of, um, projects that are going on on the two maybe um, or just to hop in a Shopify group and just sort of like get a feel for it um, but um, it, it's 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 harder it's easier to put up a Squarespace site that's for sure but then when you have all that data and that data is important and you go to migrate it it's to start do your research first and try and start where you want to end up yeah that's great advice um, so uh, I think that there's, I just want to ask one more thing. I don't get mad, um, but also don't, you can leave, <laughs> don't leave. Um, when you talk about like your data and tracking it, like, do you, how do you, I mean, we're going to have an SEO and Google analytics uh, conversation in two weeks, but when you sort of track your data for customer conversion and sales and things like how, how do you, what do you, like, how do you analyze it and turn it into actionable steps to improve your business? Do you have any like advice on that realm. And that is my final question of the evening. Do you want me to answer? Sure. Um, so that depends on what the metric is, but um, on the day to day, I find that the analytics to be tracking like sales and conversion rate um, and also like that selling product and how those trends are changing. I find the Shopify app and on my phone pretty handy. Um, 
we do use Google Analytics when we want to build reporting because uh, no site host is really all that powerful. Um, and uh, Google Analytics is just taking in a lot more. Um, and then when it comes to customer data, that's all living in our CRM software. We use um, Reamaze. Um, which I really like, and I've tried a lot of them. Um, and so that's where we're managing all customer communications. That's where we're aggregating our social communications, comments, messages, and things all in one place. But what's also being hosted there is anytime I'm having a communication with a customer that's tied back to their like larger data piece, I can see all their orders, I can make changes, I don't have to toggle between lots of things. You know, CRM is its own beast, but, um, I would say that like the biggest thing that I can impart in someone who is growing on e-commerce is that the minute that you feel like you can't keep up with your emails or your messages or your direct messages on social or your Facebook message, as soon as you start feeling overwhelmed about that, just bite the bullet and start paying for a CRM software. They're not that expensive and they, will streamline everything and your time is by far the most expensive thing in your business. Treat it as such. Just to, for people who are watching, just because it wasn't spelled out, that means constituent management. So like if, if you're really starting off and you're not really sure uh, about what that is, um, Alyssa is referring to CRM as, as like managing people. Sorry, I feel like the one that people are um, more aware of is Zendesk. I feel like maybe that, it's like mm -hmm. kind of like aggregating. I mean, there's all different types of CRM, but what I'm talking about is that sort of like ticketing system. And it's very fortunate that you, um, now there's so many different CRM um, sort of apps and softwares that are targeted at people of all different sizes. Um, so it sounds expensive and if you go try and buy Zendesk, you're going to be scared away. Um, but there's all kinds of things and live chat is often integrated into those things, which would normally be a different fee. So, um, you know, there's a lot there. So you use re, re -amaze. So it's just like reamaze.com. So I'm going to mm -hmm. share that link. Um, no, I think that's all really helpful. I think that, uh, it does get overwhelming and when you don't have, uh, the experience or the, you know, the history and you, you, you know, you, you've got these amazing products, but you don't necessarily know the technology or, or the thought process behind the best practices. Um, just even being told these websites to go and like check out, I think is really helpful for many of our makers. Um, so uh, other than that, uh, Katie, did you have any, anything else that you could, um, Oh, somebody has asked, has anyone had any luck with square marketing and transitioning those customers from in-person shows? So, yeah, so what, luck? I mean, neither, you both said that you don't do a lot of in-person shows, but um, do you have, a, you know, like advice on transitioning um, customers from in-person to online repeat shoppers? And if you don't, that's okay, because I know neither one of you do uh, in-person shows super often. I'm not familiar with Square Marketing. I do like use, I use Square in person, but also in my storefront, which I know that I, I Shopify in person is just like a whole different thing and I'm comfy with Square, but um, I'm not super familiar with Shopify, mar or sorry, Square Marketing. Okay. okay. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that either. I know that people can like add reviews and stuff on there, but I, I'm not really that familiar. Yeah. Nisha Blackwell, um, a colleague, uh, Natsland, um, uses it. Uh, she uses, has a Square site and has integrated some marketing into that, so she could speak to that a little bit more. And um, whoever asked the question is welcome to email me directly, and I can put you in touch. Um, we're happy to do that. It's not a big deal. So just feel free to reach out to us. Okay. All right. Well, I'm just going to like you know end by thanking you all for coming and let the folks know who have participated in uh, who are out there watching that um, next week, if you are a Handmade Arcade uh, maker participant in the event, we are hopeful that we'll be able to do a how to populate your Handmade Arcade virtual marketplace. The image box who is programming our site um, has said that we will be ready to do a, a tutorial on how to populate your page. Um, and, I and I'm super excited to see that. And then on November 16th, um, uh, 
Corey uh, Boskett from ImageBox is going to do a let your website work for you, understanding SEO and other analytics to increase conversion, which I think will sort of help uh, maybe understand some more ways you can be using your website more effectively. And then our final maker curriculum uh, webinar will be on November 19th, which will be telling your story online, creating compelling content for a website and social media uh, with Amy Garbark from Garbella, Jessica Grace from Una Biologicals, and John Mahood from ImageBox. Um, all three have lots of uh, great insight on that. So thank you so much, Alyssa and Katie and Jenna for your time tonight. And um, hope this was helpful for everyone. I know it was helpful. Uh, I think it was, I, I find it, I find all of this very helpful. The more um, I know, the more I can help make your community succeed, which is my ultimate goal. So um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. And if it, the sun is out tomorrow, everyone go outside and take a walk because we all <laughs> need it. <laughs> so, Water. yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, hopefully I'll see you all next week. Okay. Bye. Bye, Katie. Bye, everyone. Bye.